Chapter 8 Examples of Practicing Buddha Chitta When it comes to the examples of practicing Buddha Chitta, the first and foremost are the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. By practicing according to the vows of Buddhas and Buddhasattvas, our thoughts and actions will gradually align with theirs. By properly visualizing and imitating the actions of Buddhas and Buddhasattvas, we can turn on the same noble qualities as them. The examples of practicing Buddha Chitta are the great vows of Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. They have truly fulfilled their great vows. After making their vows, they truly act accordingly. They don't just practice for 10 years, 100 years, 1000 years, or 10,000 years, but throughout countless kalpas, and eventually they attain the perfect Buddhahood. Buddhasattvas practice in this boundless way. Therefore, their vows are boundless, and they continue acting in this way. We should learn from the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas, and follow the Guru and the Three Jewels firmly. We should gradually imitate them and strive to become closer to them. We should have faith in the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. Sometimes you are underestimating the great masters. For example, Guru Yuan Yin lived in a humble building and comforted visitors as if comforting children, saying, I will transmit empowerment to you, or I will impart teachings to you, as if he didn't know anything. In fact, great masters know everything. They may appear as if they don't know anything, and even appear to be ill, seemingly lacking abilities. In fact, their minds are vast and boundless, and they know everything. The great masters have become tired of worldly activities, and have stopped engaging in them long ago, but you are still indulging in worldly activities. What roles haven't the great Buddhasattvas played in the past? Kings, prime ministers, merchants, you name it. Buddhasattvas and great masters can attain worldly achievements so skillfully that they no longer want to engage in them. Yet, you consider yourself remarkable, thinking the teacher doesn't understand worldly activities. The great masters don't want to and cannot engage in worldly activities. Only in special and unavoidable circumstances, when they need to embody bodhicitta, may they engage in worldly activities. It may appear as if they are engaging in worldly activities, but under the guidance of bodhicitta, they are actually benefiting sentient beings. Genuine great masters don't need to run errands here and there. If something needs to be done, their dharma protectors will gather. The great masters have thousands of dharma protectors, all gathering in the heavens. Do they still need to take care of things by themselves? Their dharma protectors will run errands for them. They are just like emperors. An emperor just sits there while the ministers will take care of national affairs. Similarly, when the great masters have reached a certain stage in their mission of spreading the Dharma and benefiting sentient beings, they just sit there. They only need to chant sutras to bless us while the Dharma protectors are busy. The Dharma protectors act very fast. No matter how fast you act, you can never surpass the Dharma protectors. There are many Dharma protectors, ranging from low to high, such as the eight legions of Devas and Nagas, including Indra. 
Indra is immensely more powerful than human kings. Can't he take care of your matters? However, since you don't practice well enough, Indra doesn't want to support you. When he sees that your aspiration is not qualified, he only sends a guard to protect you. If your aspiration is qualified, Indra himself will support you. So, why would you worry about not having a Dharma protector? This is true. Indra is a diva. Additionally, there are many Nagas. If you practice diligently, the Nagas will also support you, including Cyan Nagas, White Nagas and Black Nagas. Why would you worry about not having a Dharma protector? You should practice earnestly. If you don't have a Dharma protector, it indicates that you don't practice well enough or the conditions for benefiting sentient beings are not ripe, as there are dark periods too. During the Cultural Revolution, many great masters were imprisoned. You cannot say that their spiritual practice was poor. Without Dharma protectors, such as the Devas and Nagas, the Dharma would have long disappeared. Would we still be able to sit here today? That would be impossible. Thanks to the support of the Dharma protectors, we can sit here and learn the Buddha's teachings. In the age of Dharma decline, the demons are powerful. Nowadays, the demons not only dwell outside the Buddhist community, but have also infiltrated the Buddhist community. There are too many demons in the Buddhist community. In the past, there were demons outside the Buddhist community, but very few within. However, nowadays, there are demons everywhere in the Buddhist community, making it difficult to practice. This is the situation in the age of Dharma decline. There are many demons in the Buddhist community. It is hard to discern which is true and which is false. It is like dealing with spies where you don't know which side they belong to. Moreover, there may even be double agents. In such a situation, what should you do? Some demons are double agents. They appear to be the Buddha's disciples but actually work for the Mara. Aren't they double agents? When they visit the Mara, the Mara considers them part of the Buddhist community. When they are in the Buddhist community, they are actually part of the Mara's camp. They are double agents, and even they themselves may feel confused. This is the situation in the age of Dharma decline. It is difficult to distinguish between the Buddha and the Mara, so you must be cautious. You are junior practitioners. Without guidance from others, you may become confused and unable to discern. To help you grow, sometimes I allow one or two demons to enter and let you gain some experience. Otherwise, if you only study in the Buddhist community without experiencing anything, you may become naive. Merely studying is not enough. If you only study but don't practice, wouldn't you become naive? Only by going through the interference of demons can we truly grow. Without any interference, you won't grow. Through each experience, you can learn a lesson and make a little progress. If you cannot distinguish between the true and the false, how can you guide sentient beings in the future? When you are influenced by demons, you may not even realise it. 
When it comes to the examples of practicing bodhicitta, we should not only focus on what the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas can do for us, but also pay attention to how they achieved spiritual attainments. The teachings they learned and practiced before attaining the Supreme Enlightenment are the best examples for us. Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have their own vows and practices. Some started with compassion, while some started with wisdom, showing different paths of practice for us. If you feel a strong connection with Bodhisattva Manjushri, you can study and practice the way of Manjushri, delving deeply into the scriptures and cultivating vast wisdom like him. If you feel a strong connection with Bodhisattva Kisitigaba, you can study and practice the way of Kisitigaba, following his vow of, I vow not to attain Buddhahood until all hells are emptied. If you take Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara as an example for your practice, you should make his vows your own. This is very important. You should set Avalokiteshvara's practice as your standard of practice. You should follow the example of Avalokiteshvara. Wherever there are cries for help, he will save them from suffering. Whoever calls his name, he will respond. If you take Amitabha Buddha as an example for your practice, you should make Amitabha Buddha's 48 vows your guide for practice, constantly being mindful that your goal is to accomplish the pure land and benefit countless sentient beings. We can even visualize ourselves as the incarnation of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva or Amitabha Buddha. By confirming such an identity, we can be motivated to take on the great vows of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, aspiring to attain the supreme enlightenment and selflessly benefiting sentient beings. If you visualize yourself as the incarnation of Amitabha Buddha, you should take Amitabha Buddha's 48 vows as the guide for your practice. Only when you generate the 48 vows can you visualize yourself as the incarnation of Amitabha Buddha. Otherwise, there will be problems. You should eliminate self-attachment, generate the 48 vows every day, and train your mind as the incarnation of Amitabha Buddha. Gradually, Amitabha Buddha will appear. If you genuinely practice in this way, you will soon see Amitabha Buddha. He will appear as a rainbow light and merge into your heart. This kind of spiritual attainment is achievable, but it requires genuine practice. While it is true that Buddhist practitioners should be humble and low profile, the courage to take responsibility is crucial. The phrase, keep a low profile, is popular nowadays, right? However, it's not easy to truly live it. You need to embody it through your actions. Merely talking about it is useless. We should not only be humble and low profile, but also be brave to take responsibility. In our hearts, we are not low profile because we should learn from the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and align ourselves with them. Otherwise, if we are content with being ordinary beings and only seek blessings from the Buddhas without practicing what they practice, how can we attain their qualities? When we visualize ourselves as the incarnations of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, we should also continuously align our thoughts and actions with theirs. In this way, we will eventually attain perfect realizations and actions and be the same as Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva and Amitabha Buddha.
only when we align ourselves with Amitabha Buddha in body, speech and mind are we truly visualizing Amitabha Buddha. In this way, it will be easier to go to the Pure Land and see Amitabha Buddha. In fact, Avalokiteshvara and Amitabha also attained enlightenment in this way. Not only them, but all Buddhas and Buddhasattvas attained enlightenment in this way. Before Shakyamuni Buddha, there are many other Shakyamuni Buddhas. Before Amitabha Buddha, there were many other Amitabha Buddhas. As it is said in the prayer, Namo 36 trillion 119,000 and 500 Amitabha Buddhas in the Western Pure Land. There are so many Amitabha Buddhas, including you. Namo 36 trillion 119,000 and 500 Amitabha Buddhas in the Western Pure Land. When they started their practice, they also set an ancient Buddha as an example. Buddhasattva Avalokiteshvara learned from the ancient Buddha Avalokiteshvara and practiced the teachings of great compassion, thus achieving enlightenment. Since the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas practiced in this way, we can also do the same. We can start our practice directly from the vows and practices of a Buddha or Buddhasattva by visualizing ourselves as the incarnation of Avalokiteshvara or Amitabha. We will receive great blessings. This is more effective than relying solely on our own efforts in practice. This is the extraordinary aspect of Mahayana Buddhism, which differs from Hinayana Buddhism. In Hinayana Buddhism, one practices by oneself. In Mahayana Buddhism, we can rely on the vows of the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas to support our faith and connect with them. In other words, we copy the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. We know that it is faster to copy than to write by oneself. If you choose to write something by yourself, it's not easy. But if you choose to copy, you can get the copy right away. The fastest way is to copy, which is an extraordinary aspect of Mahayana Buddhism. Simply put, this refers to Guru Yoga, which is the fastest way. However, you need to have a foundation. Guru Yoga must be based on Buddhacitta. If you don't have Buddhacitta, you cannot connect with the Guru through practicing Guru Yoga. How can you connect? If you don't have a foundation, you cannot connect with the Guru at all. We often hear that in Tibet, some masters are the incarnations of Buddhasattva Avalokiteshvara or Manjushri. In fact, if we set a Buddha or Buddhasattva as our main deity and then practice, what we eventually achieve are exactly their qualities. From this perspective, these statements are not baseless and we don't need to regard them as myths. Of course, sometimes there might be exaggerations. In fact, deity practice is not mysterious. We can incorporate some of its methods into the practice of Bodhicitta. I usually live in the back mountains of South Putuo Temple, which is the Dharma center of Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. During meditation, I visualize the entire peak of five old men as the mandala of Avalokiteshvara and visualize myself as the incarnation of Avalokiteshvara, embodying his great compassion. Then I radiate this compassion to all beings in the ten directions, hoping that through this boundless compassion, 
all sentient beings can be liberated from suffering and attain happiness. When we visualize in this way, our thoughts and actions align with Avalokiteshvara's. Of course, our thoughts and actions are not as pure and strong as Avalokiteshvara's. Our spiritual practice is akin to practicing calligraphy. After a Buddha or Buddhasattva writes, we copy it. We try to copy it as closely as possible, but there is still a slight difference. It is impossible to copy it exactly the same. However, it is already very similar to the original calligraphy work and much better than what we write by ourselves. The purity and strength of our thoughts and actions still need to be elevated. However, through continuous practice and reinforcement, our thoughts and actions can gradually approach Avalokiteshvara's. Over time, we can not only generate boundless compassion for sentient beings during meditation, but also gradually integrate it into our daily life. At that time, we will be the genuine incarnation of Avalokiteshvara. We can find out the important Buddhas and Buddhasattvas as well as their practices from the Mahayana scriptures and compile them into separate collections. For example, we can compile the teachings of Avalokiteshvara into Avalokiteshvara and the practices of Avalokiteshvara and the teachings of Kasiti Gaba into Kasiti Gaba and the practices of Kasiti Gaba. This requires two aspects of work. First, how each Buddhasattva practiced before attaining enlightenment. Second, the characteristics of each practice. This not only benefits our own study and practice, but also benefits those who aspire to practice the Buddhasattva path. In this regard, Tibetan Buddhism has many aspects that we can learn from. Mahayana Buddhism doesn't lack methods for training the mind. It is because we haven't noticed and found the suitable ways. The Flower Adornment Sutra states, there is no difference among the mind, the Buddha and sentient beings. In terms of the true nature of reality, we are not different from the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. Instead, in essence, we are the same as them. When we visualize ourselves as one with the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas, their qualities will influence our thoughts and actions. Only by visualizing and imitating the actions of the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas can we turn on the same noble qualities as theirs. Otherwise, we will forever be bound by samsaric minds and unable to transcend them. Although we are essentially the same as the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas, we always feel that they are unreachable. This is because, in our lives, it is always the samsaric minds that dominate us. Hence, what we eventually attain can only be the samsaric minds. Now, we need to examine ourselves and not see ourselves as ordinary beings. Don't look down upon yourself or give up on yourself. We should align ourselves with the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. By engaging in deity practice in this way, we are actually elevating our Buddhacitta, making it more genuine, pure and strong. If we practice according to the vows of the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas, our thoughts and actions will gradually align with theirs. In the beginning of spiritual practice, the Buddha Chitta in aspiration is the conventional Buddha Chitta, 
not the ultimate bodhicitta. However, we shouldn't be discouraged. If we properly generate the conventional bodhicitta, it will be akin to seeing the space through a glass. Although there is a glass between what we see and the actual space, we are getting closer. As long as we persistently make efforts, we will eventually shatter that glass and merge into the ocean of emptiness. Starting with practice is more powerful than starting with theory. Of course, those who start with practice need to have faith and engage in actual practice. Those who practice without understanding the theory are just blindly practicing, while those who understand the theory but don't practice are just giving lip service. Therefore, we should emphasize both theory and practice. Many Buddhists are indifferent, and most of them start with theory. They are overly immersed in theory, but are indifferent to the world. If we start with Buddhacitta and the practices of the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas, and adjust our thoughts and actions based on the right view, we will be enthusiastic and proactive. We will actively propagate the Dharma, benefit sentient beings, and undertake the missions of Buddhasattvas, rather than merely focusing on having few possessions and desires, being content, and diligently eliminating afflictions. People who dwell solely on theory often think, I shall practice after I have learned well. In fact, many principles can only be thoroughly comprehended through practice. After learning, we should contemplate, and after contemplation, we should practice. Only through practice can we gradually, truly understand the principles. Therefore, we shouldn't dwell solely on theory. After learning, you should put immediately what you have learned into practice. While practicing, you can gradually review and enhance your understanding of theory. Please bear this in mind. This is crucial. Learning and practicing should go hand in hand. If you neglect any aspect, you will run into problems. Practice is certainly important. However, some people fall into the extreme of practice. They don't study theory, so once you hear them speak, you will know that they don't study. They are diligently engaging in Dharma work and become Dharma protectors. Since they haven't thoroughly understood Buddhacitta, they become Dharma protectors who tend to be samsaric. Although they have generated a little bodhicitta and support the Dharma, their insight is too low. They lack the wisdom of non-self and genuine bodhicitta. While engaging in Dharma work, they are stuck in the stage of ordinary beings. Of course, practice doesn't mean engaging in worldly activities. Cultivating bodhicitta is also a practice. After reading An Inspiration to Give Rise to Bodhicitta, it's essential to contemplate it, which is also a practice. The seven steps of cause and effect meditation to generate bodhicitta, exchanging the attitudes toward oneself and others, and meditation on the four immeasurables are all practices. Practice doesn't mean immediately starting to work on something. In listening, contemplating and practicing, contemplating means transforming one's mind into the corresponding qualities before working. In other words, after generating a qualified aspiration, one can engage in Dharma work. If you haven't generated a clear aspiration, you will become an ordinary being 
while engaging in Dharma work. Therefore, we should learn to cultivate bodhicitta. Reciting a we generate bodhicitta doesn't mean that we have truly generated bodhicitta. In fact, we haven't truly generated bodhicitta. Hence, when we work, many samsaric thoughts arise and we find it hard to control ourselves. When working, if 80% of your thoughts are samsaric, it is not right. At least 60% of your thoughts should be bodhicitta. Then, as you work, the samsaric thoughts that occupy 40% of your thoughts will gradually be purified. Your bodhicitta should surpass your samsaric mind. Thus, your bodhicitta will gradually improve and not regress, and your samsaric mind will not fully resurface. When doing anything, if you don't practice bodhicitta, it will decline because you are surrounded by ordinary beings. When you are with ordinary beings, their minds will influence you. Please bear this in mind. Not only ordinary beings, but also demons will influence you, and the influence of demons is even stronger. The minds of ordinary beings are strong, and they can influence you. If you aimlessly hang out with them, they will influence you. If your bodhicitta is not stable, you will be immediately influenced by them. The influence of ordinary beings is strong. If you are surrounded by many worldly people and ordinary beings, how can you practice the Bodhisattva path? Is it that easy? It is very challenging. You have to stay away from them. How can you aimlessly hang out with them? If you aimlessly hang out with them, you'll be in trouble. <laughs> 